where we are focused on connecting to and building community. We are committed to helping individuals break cycles. We are delighted that you have taken the opportunity to join us. So prepare yourselves for this week's teaching and equipping session. Get ready to be educated, equipped, and set free as you listen to this week's broadcast. And thank you for joining us. Well, 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 good morning on this rainy Sunday morning, but it is still the day that the Lord has made. He continues to be faithful, renewing mercies for us this morning and loading the day with benefits. So I pray that all day long you get to experience the benefits of the Lord as they manifest. It is manifestation time. That's what we started out here at the Dream Center in our homes with that Jacqueline, Jacqueline Carr, uh, Jaquila Carr, it is manifestation time. And so as the day goes on, the benefits that God has for you and you and you, I pray that you get to experience it today. I am Apostle Deborah Edwards with Dream Ministries here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it is my honor to come before you all this morning with this word. I hope that it blesses you because I know that it blessed me even in preparing for it. And actually I thought, God, I just thank you for giving me even more time to go ahead and prepare this word. I'm trying to get this out of my face, it, uh, more time to prepare this word and to listen to you. And I am so glad that I waited. You know, sometimes when we get ready, when we're in the wait, it seems like we feel like we get antsy and it's something that we got to do. But I have learned to just wait patiently for God, to just wait for him to speak. I don't care how long, because if you wait for him to speak, you won't mess up. You won't miss an opportunity. You won't miss a benefit. You won't miss the, the opportunity to experience the new mercy if you just wait on God. So Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as we come before you this morning, we are gathered together in different spaces but with one heart and one God. And we ask right now, God, that you would send your anointing. Let it go throughout the airways to every home, to every vehicle, even those that are at work right now, God. Let them feel your presence as this word is delivered. Let it maturate their heart, God. Let it begin to be a seed that's planted and take root quickly. Let it begin to grow and mature them, Father. In the name of Jesus, we rebuke the devourer. We ask you to rebuke the devourer and every spirit that would try to come in and steal their attention intentional God or catch uh, or take uh, the devise them, Lord God, or just any way that the enemy would try to come in and keep them from hearing, Lord. And we just thank you for the angels that are gathered around your sons and your daughters right now. We thank you for this word. We thank you that it comes with power and might even in a soft, in a soft voice today. In Jesus' name, amen. I need to get through this word, guys. I really do. I want to get through it. Um, I was giving uh, Kai the scriptures and it was a lot. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get through all the scriptures, but I'm going to do my best. I want to thank each and every last one of you for uh, joining us this morning. And I pray a blessing even on those that would catch the replay. And listen, I'm going to even ask you all to look at the replay again. Even those of you who are, who are here, good morning, everybody. I see you guys coming in. Those of you that are watching it, this word is going to be so uh, packed with word, with scriptures, that I'm going to ask you ahead of time to just prepare yourself to go back sometime during the week and look at it again, because are you the anointed one? Are you anointed? We're going to talk about the anointing and exactly what that means. So thank you so much. Hey, before I get started, I want to shout out again to Karen Aiden for with her birthday and to my own sister, Donna Dallas. I want you to know that we're wishing you guys a happy birthday. We thank you all for blessing us and supporting Dream. And we just want you to know that we don't take it for granted, not at all. And so listen, as we begin to talk about the anointing, what exactly is the anointing, right? What is it? Well, well, it's the act of something being rubbed on you, being smeared on you. It is a covering that comes over you. If we look back in the Bible and look at the um, the Greek meaning for anointed, it is made up of two words, which I'm sure that I'm going to jack up, right? Cairo, which means to smear on or rub on. And then the other one, alepho, alepho, which means to anoint. In Hebrew, the term means, it has a secular connection. It means, again, the rubbing on or the smearing on of oil. OK, to cover it up. It's just like if you would um, if your house needed to be painted. But back in those days, the Roman soldiers, they took the oil and they put it on their shield. It was like it gave it a fresh coat and made it a little bit stronger. Say if you got leather seats in your car, then they have a special 
um, solution, leather cleaner, right? And they put that on there so that it doesn't crack. So you can keep your, your leather seats refreshed, right? In your car and stuff, keep them refreshed, keep them uh, together so that it lasts a long time. And so when we talk about the anointing, uh, the most prevalent use in the in the Old Testament was that the anointing was always hooked up with oil. It was always legitimized by saying you've got to be anointed with oil. Okay. So we're going to talk about both being anointed by the spirit of God and being anointed by oil. And what does the, what is, what's the two mean? What does, what do they mean? You know, are you one of the anointed ones Has God set you aside? And so when we think about uh, being covered up, when we think about being refreshed, when we are thinking about being renewed, we know that sometimes we can't do that on our own, especially when God is calling you to do a, a specific task. He He's going to anoint you for that. Some of you are anointed to be mothers. As I was discussing part of the message uh, with Kai and Yvonne yesterday, as we were um, at the Dream Center, I said, you know, uh, Yvonne, who's the director over our youth ministry, I said, she is anointed to be uh, to be over children, to teach them, you know, to guide them. And I said, sometimes when I'm talking to her on the phone and she's she's at work and the kids are just so loud, I'll say, Yvonne, you're very busy right now. I'm going to call you back. And she said, no, that's okay. I can talk. I was like, no, you can't because the noise is getting to me because I'm not anointed to do what she's doing. And oftentimes we make uh, great mistakes in the body of Christ when we begin to look at somebody else and envy what they're doing and trying to do what they want, what they're doing. And we try to move over into an area where we're not anointed to do it. Amen, somebody today. And if you do, if you need scripture for that, just look at the seven sons of Siva. They looked at the apostles, they looked at what they were doing and they thought, hey, we got it. We've been following them. We see what they say, do. We can, we hear what they say. We got it. But they were not anointed to do that. And one thing that I love about the dream team is that the Lord has anointed us to work in the area of deliverance and equipping. And I'm so glad that, you know, we're not getting boastful because we realize that this is a time, this is an era where God is raising up deliverance ministries everywhere. And I am so honored to be able to, to connect with them, to connect with them, you know, because we all need each other. We are the body of Christ. I'm not going to look at them and I'm going to bring some of them on pretty soon, hopefully. Hopefully, I'm not going to look at the, the deliverance ministry that I know of in Kentucky and say, oh, man, they, they're doing a lot better than we are. Maybe, you know, uh -uh, we better just shut them down. We better not connect with them. Or in Florida, oh, no, we no, we're the best. We're the best. No, God has selected sons and daughters. He has selected sons and daughters to do specific things. And I tell you the truth, you have been selected to do something that only God wants you to do. And though he may be raising somebody up with the same anointing, get this, your experience makes the difference. God can anoint you to be a prophet and he can anoint uh, someone else to be a prophet. Let me give you a good example. LaShawn, Kai and Yvonne all, and Mike all have a, a, a prophetic anointing. But how that is utilized is based on their experience, the lenses of their experience. And so they do not all prophesy the same way. Some of them are seers. Some of them are dreamers. Some of them will say, I hear the Lord saying this. You know, I, I hear the Lord saying that. And so nobody is coveting each other's anointing. They are in their place working together. My God today, working together. So listen, one of the most frequent weapons that the enemy is using today can be eliminated by the anointing. If we would humble ourselves and realize that the gifts and the talents that we have, we didn't get them ourselves. God decided who to give what to. And I think he knows what he's doing. And so it can be eliminated because what happens is there is this enemy, a whispering or tormenting spirit he enters in the hear, hearing gates, okay? Because I'm, I'm going to, in your in your ear gates, I'm going to make this plain in a minute, okay? He comes into your ear gates, okay? And he comes as a tormenting, as a whispering spirit, right? He's trying to cause devastation, right? He's trying to pervert what you hear, meaning that he wants to twist up what you hear because he's got to get you out of place. So he'll come with all kinds of doubt, He's perverting the truth of God so that he can render you ineffective by causing you to become weary, confused, and demented in spirit.
my God, demented in the spirit. What do I mean by demented in the spirit? I mean the truth will the, the truth will begin to become distorted. And so he can, he is like a battering ram. He just keeps talking to you and keeps talking to you and keeps talking to you until you are just tormented, until you're rubbing your head against the tree. Deborah, make it plain. When the shepherds, according to scripture, when the shepherds would be watching over their sheep and even probably some do it today now, I guess, what they would do, the, the uh, fleas and the ticks and the insects, and we're gonna we gonna call them all demons. We're gonna call them harassing demons. We're gonna call them spirit of infirmity. Okay, we're gonna call them demons that try to control the mind. But all of these insects would get trapped into the fur or the wool of the sheep. Okay, and so the shepherd's job was to try to keep the those insects from getting into the ear gate. My God, today of the sheep, mm, mm, mm. because if they didn't, it would drive the sheep crazy. And so the sheep would go and keep bamming his head against a tree or finding a branch or something and just like acting manic, acting crazy because the, his hearing was being affected. My God, today. And so listen, so the, the shepherd says, I know how to fix that. I know how to fix that. Deliverance ministries everywhere know how to fix that. So God knows how to fix that. He anoint the, the shepherd would anoint the sheep with oil. He will make sure that the oil covered their head and make sure that the oil covered their ear so that when the enemy tried to come in, he would just have to slide off. The enemy would not be able to get into their ear gate. He would not be able to per, uh, pervert what they're hearing. He would not be able to torment them by the words and the accusations and the whispering spirit. He would not be able to be a battering ram. He would anoint the sheep head with oil so that the enemy could not stand. My God, today, I'm going to get through this word. Y'all praying for me? Y'all better pray for me. Hey, put some praise hands up. Pray for me. And so anyway, that was the original use of the oil for the shepherd and the sheep. I've got to protect my sheep. And the way to protect them is to anoint them with oil so that they have a protective coating over them and the enemy cannot get to them. My God, today. Some of you may know people, and I said what well, I talked about being demented. And so I'm going to go a little bit more into that. Okay. Some of you may know people who um, may be a little demented in the spirit. I'm not talking about dementia and Alzheimer's in the natural. I'm talking about dementia, dementia and, Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's in the spirit. Some of you may know someone demonstrating signs of spiritual dementia or mind controlling demons. There are demons who are particularly designed to work with those whispering and twisted spirits to try to control your mind, often working with witchcraft. Y'all know we're a deliverance ministry. We're an equipping a service uh, center. And so I'm equipping you today by giving you some information. Now, the thing is, once I make this information available to you, you are accountable to use it. And so that's why we, we ask you to go ahead and ask questions. Email us if, if, there, if I'm saying something and you need more clarity about it, go ahead and email us. If we were in the Dream Center, you could ask us right then and there. And we are going back pretty soon. We're going to make that announcement. But we want you to have clarity and understanding in all of your getting, get understanding. In all of your getting, get understanding. And so anyway, when we make up our minds that we are servants of the, of the Most High God of Elohim, um, we want the mind of Christ, right? We want the mind of Christ. We confess with our mouths. We believe in our heart. We ask him to come and live inside of us, Lord. And so there's a transformation that begins to take place. There's a transformation that begins to take place, right? And so it takes a while for our minds to be conformed. And the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, right? And so all through scriptures, he's giving us insights. He's giving us directions. He's giving us a map. He's having dialogue with us so that we can avoid this spiritual dementia. And so let's talk about it. Now, I'm going to look at dementia in the natural because, you know, I pray that if, you, if, if I say anything and it fits you, I pray that you will repent and say, God, help me. <laughs> but it's also going to help you identify not only what may be going on with you, but what may be going on with others that you're in relationship with. 
And when you can understand something, you know how to deal with it. You know how to rightly divide the word of God, how to appropriate that that you hear. And so we're going to go with it. Now, let me give you the definition of dimension the natural, and then I'm going to compare it with a spiritual demented state. Okay. Dementia is the loss of cognitive functioning thinking, remembering, and reasoning and behavior abilities to such an extent that it interferes with a person's daily life and activities. Now I've had, mm, let's see, when I first started out, I was working with children, children. And so then I went, I did that for four years before I went into uh, the elderly population working with the people who have Alzheimer's and dementia. So kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit right here, okay? So these functions include memory. So if we look at it on the spiritual part, it says you forget your wedding vows, okay? Looking at it on, on a spiritual part, the enemy comes in and he causes you to forget your wedding vows or your commitment to others. So what do you mean, Deborah? When there is uh, spiritual dementia, the enemy is coming in to pervert your thinking. He's coming in to steal your memory. So things that you used to know that were true, he wants to pervert that. Actually, he wants to erase that and replace it with his own truth, right? So that your identity in Christ begins to be compromised and you get to a point where you begin to question who you are yourself. And it says language skills, spiritually, you lose your words like, I'm sorry. I repent. I didn't mean to do that. I didn't mean to hurt you. In the natural, you use your language because you start losing words. You start, you think that you're uh, speaking uh, a complete sentence, but you're not. You might be saying, you know, I want to go outside. Instead, you might say, I want to go to the refrigerator or I, I, I want to pick up the paper. You start losing your words. What other he, others don't hear what you think that you're saying. So when we look at it in the spiritual uh, component, the enemy comes in and he wants your words to be so twisted that you begin to, that truth and, and, and lies begin to like intertwine and you get to the point where you don't know what the truth is. So it affects your language skills. Visual perception. This is a good one. You only see things your way. You begin to have a victim's mentality. Everybody is wrong but you. Everybody is wrong but you. You know what somebody is supposed to do. You know how they're supposed to dress. You know how, if they don't say what you, somebody said to me recently, I told him, I said, you know, you hung the phone up on me. And he said, well, no, you, I just put it down because you didn't, you didn't give me the answer that I wanted. And I was like, what? He, I said, then you shouldn't ask me the question. If you already had the answer to the question that you asked me, why did you even ask me? That's what it means to have a, 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 a visual perception. It means that I already got my, my mind made up as to what this thing is supposed to look like. And if you come looking at it any different kind of way, then you're in error. So that's what visual perception, the way they see things, the way they comprehend things begin to change. And so the enemy is steadily perverting your mind. He's steadily working in your memory bank. He's steadily building up his own image inside of you. The next one is problem solving. You feel that you are within your right to stay mad and feel the way that you do. So you don't try to reason or solve the issues at hand. You operate in strife, self-righteousness, and bitterness. So in the natural, when I would see uh, be working with somebody with dementia, they think, you know, I don't, you, I would see the A's, not me. I would see the A's say, come on, I got to take you to your room. And they would have probably, you know, saw the pants and stuff. And the A would be trying to convince them your pants are so, no, it's not. I really need to take you to the bathroom. No, you don't. You know, they will fight that because they are convinced that they have no soil on them. My God, today. They are convinced that they have not urinated all on them, that they are not dirty. And so oftentimes when the enemy comes in and, and he has, uh, you are now saturated, saturated with the things of the enemy, saturated with darkness, witchcraft is just overtaking you. And then somebody comes in, God sends a prophet, he sends a wife, he sends a husband, he sends a son, he sends a friend to say, you are soiled. You are soiled. This is not of God. And you act just like the demented patients and say, no, 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 no. I, I ain't messed up. I, I ain't messed up. I didn't pee all over myself. I'm not messed up. My God today, problem, problem solving begins to, to just dwindle away. And so the next one is self-management. 
You can't make decisions for yourself. So you're often depressed and confused and therefore easily influenced and guided by those that the enemy has placed around you to lead you down the roads that you weren't supposed to go. And oftentimes these, these people that have been placed around you are pastors, their husbands, their wives, their, their parents, right? They're teachers. They've been placed around you and you and you think they're placed around you to help you. But let me tell you, when you have get to this place in called self-management where you can't manage yourself, then what happens is the enemy is trying steadily coming after your identity. You know you can't do that. You know you can't do this. You know you can't do that. You need to just come on and do it the way I tell you to do it. Jump when I tell you to jump. Bend when I tell you to bend. Eat what I tell you to eat. We have so many pastors who don't even realize that the enemy has taken control over their mind through a spirit of religion or through a Pharisee spirit, because those are the same thing, the Pharisee spirit and the spirit of religion, where you think that I'm doing it right. We're the only church that's doing it right. And so everybody here, you got to do it the way I tell you to do it. Don't you speak to nobody that don't like us. Don't you go nowhere that we don't tell you to go. We got to authorize everything. Don't You got to pray the way we pray. If I preached about John the Baptist this week, you better preach about John the Baptist that week. And so your mind, their mind is already controlled by the enemy, but they don't know it because they are still operating in the gifts that God won't take back. My God today, he will not take back those gifts. And so they are operating in their gifts. So they don't know that they have slipped down the hill with a spirit of religion or a Pharisee spirit. And you have said, I'm, I've joined myself to this ministry. I've joined myself to this organization. And so I must do what they're telling me to do. You forget that you were created in the image of God and that you're supposed to serve him and him alone. My God, today, slow it down, Deborah. You forget that he already left a manual. He already left a road map. He already left something to, so that you would know that your identity is in him. Your identity is not in your husband. It is not in your wife. It is not in your pastor. It is not in your apostle. It's not. Your identity is in him. You were created in his image and made in his likeness, right? And so anytime somebody tries to tell you, you got to do this or you're not holy, you got to bake raisin bread and, and, and not wheat bread. You know, you better put salt in your potatoes and, and not garlic powder. Anytime somebody tries to govern your life like that, my God, today, you are you have lost the ability to manage yourself. And so in the natural, when we look at patients that are demented further on down the road, they lose the ability to manage themselves. Are you a little demented? You need to be anointed. We're gonna get some oil and we're going to anoint you with oil, okay? And so the next one, the ability to focus and pay attention. You have moments of clarity, which is what demented uh, uh, patients have. They have moments of clarity. And so I remember this one guy, he never said anything. And so I, I knew he could hear, his son had instructed us, you know, what channels to keep the TV on, but he wouldn't speak. And I would still just go in and I would read to him during my visits because I knew he could hear me and I would read. And then one day after about six months, he turned over and looked at me and he said, this man who I had been seeing for six months, who had not said a word, he looked at me and he said, you're so anointed. I need to help you. He said, People have got to hear your voice. You've got something for the people. I've got to get you on TV because what you have to say is more important than that other guy. And I said, what other guy? He said, you know, that other guy, that, that, that Joel person, that Joel person in Texas. I said, really? And at this point I'm crying. Because on my way there, I was talking to God about what exactly he wanted me to do. And he woke this man up and gave him a moment of clarity so that he could release that word to me. That was the last time I saw him because his son lived in Kentucky. I didn't know that the son was making arrangements to bring his dad to Kentucky with him. So I was never able to go back to see if he had another moment of clarity. And so as it is in the spirit, when you get to this part, your heart, you 
it's difficult to pay attention and to stay focused because the enemy doesn't want you to pay attention to the light. He's going to draw you away from the light. And anybody that is speaking truth and light, the enemy is going to come in and say, don't listen to them. Don't talk to them. Don't go with them. He's going to shut it out. Don't watch that show. Don't listen to their music. And, and it's okay if you listen to look at all kind of movies that 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 feed the lust in you, that feed the vision in you. It's okay. But anybody that has light, anybody that has truth, he's going to draw your attention away from that person. He's going to draw your attention away from that ministry. He's going to draw your attention away from that organization because he's got to keep you unfocused. He's got to keep you unbalanced. He's Because the minute you see light and you're drawn to it, he's afraid that you're going to go away. When we get to this part, let me tell you this. Y'all, listen, I'm teaching this morning. I hope you're writing. If not, you better watch it again. Territorial spirits. I don't even have this in my notes. I might be messing myself up right now. Territorial spirits. Territorial spirits will go with this focus and inability to pay attention because you can go to one city and those spirits cannot follow you uh, to that other city. They are bound in the area that they are. Because remember, demonic spirits don't, they can't fly. You're talking about principalities that can go one place and the other, but the demonic spirits, they can't fly like that. That's why they walk and roam around. They're ro walking and roaming around in the same area. That's why they ask Jesus, don't, don't send us away because uh, we don't know, we don't know about Georgia. Don't send us to Georgia. <laughs> Definitely don't send us to Mahogany Court, right? Don't send us there. You know, let us just go into the pigs. Because we know the peers can travel far. We know that they're going to stay in this territory. I'm sure they didn't know the peers were going to go in the water, though. But territorial spirits means that they are bound here. And so most ministers can tell you that sometimes it's easier when they get called out of town or out of state to minister. They minister with a different freedom because at home they're fighting the territorial spirits there at home that are trying to prevent them from getting truth out. And so when you go from one place, from one state to another, you get to hear truth, right? But then when you go back to your home state, those same territorial spirits are waiting for you. And they're going to try to eradicate or erase whatever truth did while you were in the other state. My God, today. And so no matter what, you might have come back home and you were like strong, like this is what I'm supposed to do. I know this is what I'm supposed to do. But those battering rams and those whispering spirits are going to say, no, 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 no. They're going to remind you of your dependency on them. They're going to remind you that you need them. They're going to remind you that you can't make it without them. And if you don't get to light again, because see, you got to keep being anointed. You got to keep being filled up, right? You got to keep saying, okay, God, show me what to do. All right, God, talk to me. When truth is hid, and that is the role of this spirit, to hide truth, to hide light, so you can't even hear my God today. And so anyway, some people, this is my last point, I think, with this one. Some people with dementia cannot control their emotions and their personalities may change. Now, listen, do you know anybody like that whose personality has changed? You'd be like, well, that gone. She didn't act like that when I married her. He didn't act like that when I was dating him. Dad, a good one, my grandchildren. <laughs> that oldest one would eat up just about everything. But now he'll say, and I used to love, and I could be wrong with this food, but let's, let's just say cornbread. He would love it, right? And then he was like, I don't eat that anymore. Donovan's coming home, so I'm going to make some macaroni and cheese. Make some macaroni and cheese. Oh, I don't eat that anymore. And I'm like, what? What? And then the other ones are following suit. Oh, I used to eat that. I don't eat that anymore. Grandmother, are you really going to eat that? Girl, we've been eating this since you took your first breath. No, I'm not going to eat that anymore. And so anyway, what happens is, when you we say you're not going to eat that anymore, no, something is changing in your in your personality. Something is changing with your desires, what you like, what you don't like. And so, when you when the when spiritual dementia set in, you begin to change your personality, the things that you used to do. We've had in the natural, I would have sweet little old mamas cussing everybody out, everybody a b, everybody the n word, everybody. And the children would just be devastated because they would say, that's not mama. Mama never cursed. That's not mama. Mama's not, not, not uh, prejudiced. That's not mama. 
mom has lost her ability to think rationally, to make decisions. And so her emotions and her personalities are changing. It says you can come up with all kinds of things, like the things that used to be your favorite things to do, and, and you can no longer do those. Dementia ranges in severity from the mild stage, the mildest stage, uh, which is in the beginning, to affect the person's functioning to the most severe stage that really affects how they live. The enemy wants to change how you live. Why? Because he knows that God said, I'm coming to give you life and that more abundantly. And so the role of the enemy when you have spiritual dementia is to shut you down altogether. So you are depressed. You are in despair. You can't make decisions. You want somebody to tell you what to do. You've lost your identity. All of that. that that's what he wants to do. It says you used to hear God's voice. Now your pastors and your leaders have become your God and you can only hear their voice, even though it is contrary to the will and the word of God. You begin to trust, lean on and rely on your leaders and your spouses, your spouses that are out of order. They're out of order because if they're not doing what God says to do, if your wife is not doing what God, what the Bible says she's supposed to do, if your husband is not doing, if your husband's not doing what, what he's supposed to do as the man of the house, OK, and you begin to say, well, I know we shouldn't do this, but my husband, he's the priest. He's the head of the house, so I got to do it. You got spiritual dementia. Well, the Bible says that the husband is, is the head of the, the lady, but it also says that God is the head of the husband. And if your husband or your wife is not manifesting the characteristics of God and you rather Go over the word of God. Well, I know the word of God says, you know, I know what the word of God says, but I'm supposed to submit. I'm supposed to submit. You got spiritual dementia. Come on over here. Let us anoint you with some oil. I crack myself up. Okay, listen. Hey, listen, we're going to get on with this. In Isaiah, this is what the anointing is for. In Isaiah 10, 27, it says, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off his shoulder and his yoke shall uh, uh, be broken off his neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Okay, pay close attention to this. It says it's gonna be broken off of his neck. Somebody really needs to hear this. It's gonna be broken off of his neck, right? Because of the anointing. This is when we're talking about a spiritual anointing. We're not talking about the oil right now. We're talking about the anointing that comes from God. That's to destroy the yoke around the neck. Now get this. In another translation, it says it destroys the fat. It tries to come uh, against the fat. Now, what does the fat do? The fat means that that person has been building up or the enemy has just been building up. Um, the person has been building up, building up muscle. The person is building up spiritual muscle, okay? He's working out. He's, he's quoting scriptures. Even though his body is in pain, he's quoting those scriptures. Even though his marriage is jacked up, he's quoting the scriptures that pertain to that. Even though his finances is jacked up, he's, he's calling on Jehovah Jireh. And so he builds spiritual muscles, right? And as he, as he begins to build his spiritual muscles by reciting and believing and declaring the word of God, he gets strong in his neck. You've seen uh, men that work out and then their neck like 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 their neck is big. Right. And so he said, listen, when you begin to put God first and you begin to develop those spiritual muscles, the yoke that the enemy put on you in the first place will no longer be able to contain you because the anointing will come and break that off of you because you are now stronger than you were when the yoke was first placed on you. My God, today. My God, today, you've got to build up your spiritual muscles, no matter what you are facing, no matter when the enemy put that yoke on you, when you begin to declare the word of God, no, no matter how much pain you're in, no matter how much physical, emotional or spiritual pain you're in, when you stop listening to others who are not listening to God and you say, God is just me and you. What does your word say? Your word says I'm supposed to cleave to my wife. Your word says you sent your word to heal me. Your word says I will prosper and 
be in good health even as my soul prosper. Your word says I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. I'm the lender and not the borrower. I'm blessed when I go out. I'm blessed when I come in. When you begin, my God, today, when you begin to put the word of God first, the enemy cannot contain you because when you give God back his word, he sends his spirit and in his spirit is his anointing to destroy the yoke that was on your neck. A lot of you all have loved ones and you know that the enemy has them by the neck. Come on here. Come on, somebody. You know that the enemy has them by the neck, but God is saying, listen, you keep making the declarations. You keep being the sacrificial lamb. You keep declaring my word over that person. Declare your word, my word over your husband, over your children, over your business, over your ministry, over your finances, over your health. Let my word be the final say so. I got to calm down. Y'all, I'll be too passionate sometimes. First law of mention. First law of mention. When we talk about the anointed oil, and this is when, when um, Jacob, when Jacob is on his way back to meet his brother, and he has this dream, and he sees, he lays his head on this rock, and so he sees angels ascending and descending, angels ascending and descending. And he says, surely the Lord was in this place. Now he's traveling in the wilderness, right? He's not in a sanctuary. He's not in a 5,000 seat um, sanctuary. He's not in a 5,000 square feet home. He is in the wilderness. And that's where he met God. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Surely he's in this place. And I did not know it. And so listen here. He takes a rock and he anoints that rock with oil. What is he doing that for? He said, because it is sacred. It is sacred. And I want to remember that this is where I met God. See, some of us, when we come out of our trials, we say, I don't ever want to go back to that again. My daughter spent a total of about 31 days in the hospital. She don't ever want to go back to that place again. But we need to anoint that place with oil so that she remembers it. I'm talking about spiritually anointed so that she remembers that God met her in that hospital room week after week when she called, she will call me and say, mama, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it, mama. I know that I'm dying. And I'll be like, you're not dying. You are not dying. God met her because I couldn't get there. She was in her wilderness experience. And even if I could have got there, I am not a replacement for God. See, I will never have my girls believe that my voice is stronger than God. Sometimes I think I get on their nerves. Did y'all worship today? Did you pray today? This is what we're standing on today. You know, my voice will never be as powerful and as strong as God because I'm afraid of him. He created me. I didn't create him. But in your wilderness experience where God shows up, he wants you to sanctify that place so that first of all, you won't forget the pain that you were in, and you won't forget how he delivered you. My God, today, you won't forget that he showed up on your journey. You won't forget that he showed up when you were depressed. You won't forget that he showed up in your grief. You won't forget that he showed up when you didn't know how you were going to pay your bill. You won't forget that he showed up when it looked like your wife didn't love you no more. You won't forget that he showed up when it looked like your husband didn't love you no more. You won't forget when he bought brought your children back home after they had been out in the street for a while. Anoint that place with oil. Make it sacred. Make that memory sacred that I had a rough time right here in my wilderness. But I remember that God was in that place and I didn't even know it. He was in that place and I didn't even know it. And so when we do that, we can make sure that we remember. I was at a facility and I was serving them communion. And I said, you know, the, the scripture says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I said, so before all of you take communion, I want to hear your story. What are you remembering God about? And so Jenny says to me, she says, listen, now, I know you're going to think I'm crazy. I know this may not be much, but you asked me a question. I'm going to give you an answer. It may not be the answer that you want, but I'm going to give you my answer. This is what I'm remembering him for. And the biggest smile came over her face. And she said, when I woke up this morning, I was able to get out of bed by myself. And I walked to my bathroom by myself. Nobody had to help me. And when I got through in the bathroom, I walked to the kitchen by myself. 
and I was able to get my own water by myself. She said, so you know, I'm gonna write that in my happy memory book. And I said, well, what is a happy memory book? And she said, every time God does something for me, I write it down. She anoints it with oil. I'm just saying that's what is happening. Because when I'm talking about anointing with oil, I'm not always talking about physically anointing with oil. I'm talking about making that thing sacred in your heart, making it sacred in your spirit. She says, I write it down. So on days when I'm not having a good day, on days when I need somebody to get me out of bed, on days when I need somebody to get me dressed, I go and I look at my happy memory book and I remembered how God showed up, how on this day, he let me get out of bed. On this day, he gave me strength to go to the grocery store and he gave me so much strength to go to the grocery store. I knocked on my neighbor's door and I said, I'm going to the grocery store. Is it anything I can get you? She said, that's what's in my happy memory book. Those are the occasions that are anointed with oil. Those are the occasions that are sacred in her life. So oftentimes God begins to deliver us and we get happy just like in the book of Judges when he would deliver them, they would get happy and they would enjoy that prosperity and then they would forget that they had ever been in bondage. And when you forget you've been in bondage, you'll forget God. You'll forget the one that delivered you out of bondage. I gotta get on with this message, my God, today. And so she said, I don't, I'm never gonna forget him. I'm not going to forget him. And so in Exodus 25, I, I'm, I'm going to try to get through with this message. In Exodus 25, one through nine, God is speaking to Moses and he says, um, tell the Israelites that they are to set aside offerings for me. Receive the offerings from everyone who is willing to give. And so that is the question I have for you today. Are you willing to give? My God today. Are you willing to give what God is requiring of you? Because when he anoints us and every last one of us are anointed to do something for the kingdom, I don't care if, it's, if you're a beautician, you are anointed to fix hair. I don't care. I was getting my hair done the other day and um, my stylist was telling me about another uh, beautician and she said, she bad. She was like, she came back and she bad. And I said, is she? I said, well, what is her specialty? She said, everything, everything. And I thought that that was so commendable of my stylist because she wasn't being envious of the, the new style. She said, that girl is bad. She can lay hair out no matter what you want. But what does that tell me? She's anointed to do that. She's anointed to do it, okay? She might not be dotting every I, she might not be crossing every T, but she's anointed to do that. And so she went out for a while and tried to do some other things, but she had to come right back to do what she was anointed to do. Some of you have went out. You have went out to, to pursue other things that God did not anoint you to do, but you wanted to get on this bandwagon like everybody else and, and do what everybody else is doing. You're not anointed to do that. If you're a prophet, prophesy. If you're a psalmist, sing. If you're an evangelist, go out and win souls. If you're a cashier, do it to the best of your ability. You're anointed to be a cashier. You make everybody day better when they come into your presence. Calm down, devil. Oh my God, today. And so God says, listen, I only want people who are willing. Are you willing? Are you willing to do it? He says, now these are the offerings I want you to receive. And he goes and tells them everything. He says, and, and, and I need the spices for the anointing oil uh, and the fragrant incense. I want this type of stone and that type of stone. He says, and then if they are willing and they go and get everything that I tell them to get, he says, then tell them to build something. Because see, I want to be, I want to make sure that they, they have my heart. I want to make sure that they are willing and obedient before I come down and live with them. I want to make sure that they got everything in order before I come down and live with them, before I come down in my presence, feel their atmosphere and my spirit feel their body and they begin to have my mind. Can they be willing? And if they're willing and obedient, they will follow my instructions. And so he says, tell them to get all of this together. And if they do all of that, he says, then tell them to build a sanctuary. Tell them to build a sanctuary where I can come and I can sit with them. Tell them to build a sanctuary for me so that I can come and sit with them and live with them. So can he do that for you? Have you been faithful over the few things? Have you been faithful to do what he, the first works that he told you to do? Has he found you willing and obedient? Has he? Has he found you to be willing and obedient? 
because only then you guys know if you've been following me for a while you know that i'm always talking about how you live how you live uh, you know, do you keep your house clean? Is it cut cluttered? Because, and people think that that has nothing to do with your, your spiritual self, but read this again. He told them exactly what to do. And then he started telling them, it says, let them construct a sanctuary for me so that I can live among them. You are to construct it following the plans I've given you, the designs for how the, uh, the house is to look and the design for its furnishings. God cares about your sofa. <laughs> he cares about the chair. He cares about your bedroom. He cares about it. He says not just the building, but even how it's decorated, even the furnishings that's going to go in the building. So the next time somebody says, you ain't got to listen to her. God don't care about your house being cluttered. He don't care about your house being dirty. Keep it like that. And then we'll see how you grow spiritually. We'll see if you're able to rightly divide the word. We'll check out your prayer life. We'll check out your discernment. Because you know what? If his spirit is missing, you don't have his fruit. If his spirit is missing, you don't have his seed. He says, follow the first things first. Then build a place. Be obedient and willing. Then build a place. And then I'm going to come down and live with you. How about that? And so another example would be the Shumanite woman. She said, this is a man of God. This ain't even God. This is a man of God. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build, we're going to build an extension to the house so that when he comes, that's just going to be his room. When he comes, I'm going to put a bed in there. I'm going to put a table in there and a lamp and a chair in there. I'm going to build it for him. I'm going to keep it clean. Because you know what? They didn't have no Marco Polo. They didn't have no social media. They didn't have telephones or telegraphs. They didn't have none of that. And so what, what are you saying, Deborah? That means that she had to keep that room prepared at all times because it wasn't like he could send her a message. The Africans weren't beating the drums. He couldn't send her a message and say, I'll be there March 15th. I'm coming in town. Is it all right if I stay with you? There were no reservations. And so she had to keep that place prepared for him all the time because she recognized the presence of God on him. So if she can recognize the presence of God on him and keep a place prepared, how come we can't just recognize the presence of God? How come we can't keep a place prepared inside of us, a place prepared inside of our home? How come we got to rush and clean up when company's coming over? Because we never know that that company might be an angel. The Bible says we entertain them unaware. We never know. I got to finish this message. The anointing comes. When the anointing comes, you got to humble yourself, right? Humble yourself and say, Lord, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of the spiritual dementia. I'm guilty of not preparing a place, keeping a place prepared for you to come in. So God, I need you to heal me. I need you to show me. I need your, your, your word to be a magnifying glass to me, to show me every area in my life that I need to get back. This is not a message to beat you up. This is a message to get you in place because you're needed. God would not have put you here and let you stay here. He could have took you out with coronavirus or anything else. But you're here and he wants to anoint you for a particular job, for a particular time. He wants to anoint you to do what he's called you to do, right? And so this is a time where you say, God, forgive me. I've been slack. God, forgive me. God, I didn't dot that I. God, forgive me. God, I didn't cross that T. God, forgive me. God, I want to serve you, God. I want to do what you called me to do, Lord. I don't want to be like Deborah. I don't want to be like Sue. I don't want to be like Sam. I don't want to be like Mary. I want to be just what you called me to be, oh God. I may not be able to preach like Paul. I might not be able to sing like angels, but I love you, Lord. Y'all remember that song? But I love you, Lord, and I want to do what you have called me to do. And so when God anoints us, we can look at uh, I'm going to expedite it. We can look at uh, David. David was anointed three different times. I can't read all of these scriptures for the sake of time. First Samuel 16, 13, 2 Samuel 2 and 4, 2 Samuel 5 and 3. The first time that he was anointed to be king was when he was just a lad, right? And Samuel came in and anointed him to be king in the presence of his brothers, right? The second time he was anointed, he was anointed by Judah, the men of Judah, to be king over Judah, right? And then the third time he was anointed, they all came together to anoint him to be king over Israel, right? And so the first time was a private anointing. God will anoint you in the private, in, in behind closed doors. A lot of you have been anointed behind 
behind closed doors. My God, today I need more time. You've been anointed behind closed doors. Nobody is seeing your preparation period. Nobody is seeing what, what God, the struggles that God allowed you to go through so that he can mold you and shape you and equip you to carry the anointing because we have to be able to carry the anointing of God I feel him right now. We have to be able to carry that anointing. And so behind closed doors, in the privacy of your home, at the in, in your cubicle at work, behind the cash register, God is anointing you. He's preparing you. And nobody sees it yet. Nobody sees it yet. Only David's family saw when God anointed him and they didn't even like it. So you know David didn't go out boasting say, I'm anointed because he saw the reception that he even got from his family. In the process of God anointing you, even your family members might reject you. They may not want to hear what you got to say, but that ain't stopping God from anointing you. It's not stopping him from anointing you. So you that's why you've got to have a relationship with him. That's why you've got to hold on to his hand. That's why you've got to be about his business. No matter who believes that God has called you, no matter who believes that God has anointed you, no matter who believes that God has appointed you, you keep your focus on him. Don't allow spiritual dementia to come in and take over you. Don't allow false leaders with Pharisee spirits and husbands and wives who are not submitted to the word of God to come and lead you away. God has anointed you. God has anointed you. And so we looked at all of those places where God had anointed David. And David, one by one, God saw him faithful with the first anointing. And then God said, I can trust you a little bit more. So let me anoint you to be king over Judah. And he was faithful with that, even though he was being attacked, even though he was being sought after, even though uh, Saul was trying to kill him, he stayed faithful with that. And when he stayed faithful with that, God said, now, now you're ready to be king over Israel. Now you're a man after my own heart. And so God wanted to know that can if he can trust you with this, level of anointing, another one is coming. And when the other one comes, if he can trust you with that one, another one is coming and another one is coming. And so it was the same for our Savior and our Lord. Psalms 45, 6 and 7, it says, your throne, O God, is forever. And a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You're, you love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you what? With the oil of gladness. So that's the first, that's one of the, one of the anointings. I don't know if it's the first one, but that was an anointing that, that Jesus Christ got, that God anointed him with oil. And then when you go to Hebrews 10, five through seven, here comes Jesus and he was anointed what? To come into the earth, my God, today. It says, therefore, when Christ enters into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but instead you have prepared a body for me. So God had to anoint him, uh, uh, an anointing just to come into the earth. He had to anoint him just to come into the earth. Read it yourself. I know I'm trying to get through this because it's important. Mark 1, 9 through 11. Here Jesus is anointed what? to go into the into the uh, desert to meet Satan. It says that's what he was appointed to do. So when John baptized him and he saw the, the dove ascending on him, that was another anointing. And that anointing was to give him the strength and the tenacity to stand 40 days in the wilderness and, and come up against the desert. He was anointed to do that, right? And then when we get to uh, Luke, the fourth chapter, he says he opens up the book. And he says, the spirit of the Lord, come on, somebody, come on, somebody. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? There were several things that the spirit of the Lord came upon him to do, anointed him to do, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he was anointed again. Come on, somebody. He was anointed by the, by the woman with the alabaster box. We know her to be Mary now. And listen, she didn't put the oil on his head. She anointed his feet, right? She anointed his feet with tears because he was being anointed to go down Calvary's cross. He was being a uh, Calvary's hill. He was being anointed to go up that hill for you, anointed to go up that hill for me. So let me tell you, if I'm not making it plain, God will send his anointing, his empowerment, the thing that he needs to cover you up, to shield you up, to keep the enemy out of your ear, to make your, your, your armor slick and make it renewed. Because sometimes we get torn and 
tattered in this battle, in the battles that we face called life. And God says, I'm going to refresh you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to paint my, I'm going to paint myself on you. You're going to start smelling like me, my God, today. I'm going to transform your mind. That's what I'm going to do for you. Because I need you to reflect my glory. There's something that I need you to do. I don't care where you work at, whether you work at the hospital, whether you work uh, for the energy company, for the telephone company. I don't care if you work for Chick-fil-A or Kroger's. You are anointed to touch and change people's lives. Don't ever, ever... Uh, take for granted what you are anointed to do. Don't ever begin to covet somebody else's anointing because there are people who are designated to cross your path and you are designated to cross their path for one reason only, so you can point them to Jesus. I don't care what your business is. I don't care what your ministry is. It's all supposed to lead back to reconciliation, to reconciliation. He says, then the, it says that Jesus of Nazareth was anointed. Listen, this is Acts 10, 36 through 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit and with power. And after he got that anointing, he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil. So for those of us in ministry, that's the anointing we need so that we can go about healing and delivering the oppressed. We don't get that anointing so we can keep building churches, so we can make people bow down to us, so we can tell them, you got to give me some birthday money. You got to do this for me. You got to honor me. I got to have a day every week, every month. You got to be my day. No, you are anointed to set the captives free, not to make your name big, but to make God's name big. First Chronicles 16. Listen, Sometimes we we get we don't know about the people who, who are being anointed behind closed doors, but God knows and he gave a warning. He said, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. Just because they didn't come up in your school of, of learning, just because you didn't ordain them, don't mean that God didn't anoint them and ordain them. So he says, listen, you better be careful. You better be careful who you put your mouth on. You better be careful who you, who you think you can decide who's anointed and who's not. Don't touch my anointed. That's what he said in his word. And then in Leviticus, God is always anointing us to do something. Give me five minutes, y'all. Give me five minutes. I had said, I thought I was going to deliver this word last week. And I said, God, for, for two, not, I didn't even pray about this. I was like, why do I want to look at Superman? For those of you who have loved ones that are not saved, this is for you. And I kept saying, I was like, Mike, last week, I was like, for some reason, I want to look at a Superman movie. And he was like, well, find it. On all of those channels, I could not find a Superman movie. So when I got home from the Dream Center last, yesterday, I was kind of a little wore out, a little tired. And I said, you know what? I'm going to sit here for a minute and I'm going to let whatever is on TV watch me fall asleep. And I turned on the television and it was a Superman movie, Man of Steel. And I said, hmm, I couldn't find this movie nowhere during the week. And here it is. Been wanting to see it for two weeks. Don't know why. Don't know why I wanted to see a Superman movie. And I said, hmm, what are you doing here, God? And I began to look at the movie. And there are movies that prophesy. And if, you, you know, if you've ever talked to anybody that's been in any of my training classes, they'll tell you that there are movies that prophesy, just like there are relationships that prophesy. And as I was sitting there watching it, and he was up, his, the enemy was General Czar, okay? And so in the beginning of this one, the man of steel, it shows how as a child, he didn't know who he was. He didn't know his identity. And his dad kept saying, but don't show your strength right now. Don't show your strength right now. It's not time for you to show your strength. It's not time for you to show who you are anointed. The time is going to come when the things that you hate about yourself, you're going to see that they were given to you to save many people. And so he didn't know at five that he was anointed to call and call to the world to save the world. Okay. And so as I list, listen to the dialogue between him and General Czar, he said, General Czar said, you care a lot about these people. So you think you were sent here to save these people, but I was sent here to destroy because from the moment of my creation, I had been trained to be a warrior, to destroy, and that's all I know. So General Saul would say, I've been trained to destroy, but those of us who belong to Christ, we've been trained to heal. We've been trained to restore. 
And so I said, okay, God, this is just like the first movie you ever gave me to, um, to, to preach on. I was going to prison ministry and I didn't, I kept saying, God, I don't feel you. Where's your spirit? Because I don't want to stand in front of these men. I don't feel you, God. Where's your spirit? I don't know what you want me to say. I've been studying. You haven't spoken to me. Where's your spirit, God? And he said, take them to the, uh, the, Carib the Pirates of the Caribbean's. And I was able to preach that message. And those men were standing up on their feet. Yes, I heard that. I know that. And at the end, after we talked about the movie, I said, Christ did that for you. You were the treasure that he stood on and shed his blood for. And they were able to connect. So we, some of you may have uh, loved ones. You can't give them scriptures right now. But God will give you some type of imagery that they will be able to connect with. And once they connect with that imagery, imagery, that movie, you'll be able to, to just slide them over to the words. And let, now let me show you what the scripture says about that. Last scripture, I'm coming, coming out of this. Acts 2, 17 through 18. And it shall be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see divinely prompted visions and your old men shall dream divinely prompted dreams. Even on my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. They shall prophesy. Meaning what? They're going to speak into existence the oracles of the Lord. They're going to speak into existence the word and the will of the Lord. We're not going to all sound alike, but when we go to God and allow him to process us, to purge us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse us and sanctify us and then anoint us so that everything that's not like him is broken off of us, but anoint us so that we are covered and we are smeared, smeared uh, with his presence on us so that when people see us, they don't really see us. They see him. And that's what God wants. He wants us to live our life so that people don't see us. They see him. They feel his love through us. They feel his compassion through us. They see us. And listen, I'm not mad, but sometimes people are like, you sound like you mad. No, it is just the passion because I realize that time is running out and I'm trying to grab as many souls as I can. I'm trying to, to, uh, to get this word out, you know, that Jesus loves you, but he ain't no punk. He ain't no punk. He, he still loves you even if you make the decision to go to hell. He still loves you even if you make the decision to not be willing, to not be obedient, to not repent, to not get things fixed, to not leave your offering at the altar and go back and be reconciled to your brother. He still loves you, but to hell you going. To hell you going. Unless with all of your heart, you submit to him. You humble yourself. And say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. Show me any and every way that I let you down. I don't mean to let you down. I don't mean to hurt people. I don't mean to offend people. God, help me to do your will. Help me to do your will, God. Help me to love like you love. Help me to be long-suffering, God. We don't really want to be long-suffering, God. Y'all listen, that ain't no joke. Being long-suffering, it ain't no joke. But God will anoint you to be long suffering. When you want to walk out of the situation, God will give you an anointing to stay there until the job is done. That's how much he loves us. That's how much he loves us. I'm grateful. Listen, couldn't get through it all, but I hope that I gave you enough to know that you are anointed, that God has is sending an anointing and maybe he anointed you to do something last year and this year he's anointing you for something else. You know, <clears throat> we had to get a, a new piece of equipment yesterday and Kai got so excited and she was like, ooh, I can't wait to work on that. She's anointed to do that. The way the team have their gifts and they execute LaShawn with her ability to just make sure order is, is taken care of, they are anointed for that. I said, there's no way I could do what they do. I might be the founder of, of Dream and the head of Dream, but I recognize the gifts, callings, and anointing in all of them. And it tells me that I can't do it without them. I can't do it without them. I can't. When you realize that you are the body of Christ, fitly joined together, then you can accomplish the will of God. Ask him to anoint you every day to accomplish his will in the earth. I love you all. May God continue to bless you and keep you. Look at this again. Share it if you can. 
And we'll be back with you all tomorrow night for our discipleship training class. May God bless you and keep you all. Bye-bye.